Not just the return of Paul Mullen this week, then now for the return of Welcome to Wrexham as well. We've both watched episode one of season two. What were your thoughts on it? Uh, thoughts? I've got I've got plenty of them. Uh, plenty of them for the podcast and for YouTube. Our initial thoughts were it felt it felt like a lot was going on, and and yet. My first caveat for this, and I said it last season, I'll say it this season. I think if you follow Wrexham day in, day out like we do, you just simply know too much. You, 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 I, all I can spot is the things that don't make the cut. Like, for example, I was so surprised that we didn't see any of Rob McElhenney in the box at Chesterfield. I mean, he was there. We saw him there when we were at the game. And, and fair enough, we don't want to see loads and loads of that performance. It was absolutely atrocious, but... You know, I, I don't know. I, I, I thought there'd be. I thought there were a lot of subplots in one episode of forty minutes. I think you had your recap, which I think was necessary. You needed to do that because people might have only picked this up after season one. They might, they might not have, you know, uh, given their life and soul to to it like we have every single week and every single day. Then you had the leveling up stuff, the cop, which. Again, the timeline just felt a bit strange because you had the Eastley game, which obviously the season opener. Kind so of... you've got a, it starts off with a match in August, but is interspersed yeah. with an event that happens in December when you have the royal visit. Now, part of me wonders whether that's the they... hook for people who aren't T- twofold. Is that the hook, or are they just trying to get the kind of bureaucracy side out of it? Maybe they just thought this isn't... I don't know if they'd have thought this because they wouldn't have put it in otherwise, but whether it was this isn't all that jazzy and we want to get into the stories, we want to get into the football, but we kind of just need to shoe on it in because I don't actually think they yeah. made a big deal well, of there it. Is, yeah. Well, there is that comment in the in the doc, isn't there, that they say we're trying to get funding from a Tory government, which right. so having the royal visit might help with that. And then fundamentally, when the funding doesn't come, it's also... Well, the Tory seat might not Rex might not be Tory seat by the next general election, so they've not got the long term interest of investing maybe in the area. So yeah, like I said, I think that is interesting. But for me, I think fundamentally with you, we we know Rex and we see every tweet that goes out. We know all this stuff. Yeah. So for us, the details do do sort of play on my mind a bit. But you're you're catering to an audience who is primarily aren't Rex and fans, maybe not even right. football fans, right? So you've got to hit that sweet, sweet note of being able to be accessible for everyone, still have enough for the hardcore small demographic, and then you've got to try and get different documentary aspects out there. You've got to have the match footage. The owners are a huge drawing point for people. The royal visit was was massive global news, whether you like it or not. You've then got human interest stories. You've got the Rob Layton injury. You've got Mark Howard sort of dealing with abuse anyway. You've got the signings. We've got some new players here. Here's one of them, Elliot Lee, scores goals, bang, bang, bang. We've still got football to get on with. Here's what happened last time. And I do just think that for 40 minutes, it's just a bit too condensed and it's a bit too... Things are still coming at you from, from, the, from the last minutes as well. So, yeah, I'm interested to see how the series develops. And, of course, we know we've got the uh, women's side of things as well to come in the yes. weeks ahead. I'm just interested to see how how they sort of handle having so many because there is so much you could get into with Wrexham and it's like let's see what Wayne's up to let's see what's happened since then but also let's move on and show you the next season so it's really interesting Rich the positive I'm going to I'm going to give you some of my positives so you can give me some of yours I'm going to focus on the positives first before I maybe knuckle down on some of the things that slightly bug me but the positives I thought the interview with Phil Salmon AEC I thought that was really nice and I, I don't know what when I was, but I was a little bit emotional when he was getting emotional, just talking about I've never played for this club, I love this club, but being on the back of the shirt, I sort of felt like I have, you know, in a way, and it yeah. kind of meant meant a lot to him. And I know he means a lot to a lot of people. He's given a hell of a lot to the football club, and maybe he's one of them that doesn't quite get the notoriety that others have. And that's not just through the dock, but just maybe he's been quite happy to be in the background a little bit so I'm kind of glad he he got that and the cop barriers I know have have made a lot of people very happy that they've got part of that um, and Neil Roberts who we had on recently talking about the cop I think in a way I again I know you haven't got endless hours I mean I would watch like a hundred parter on Welcome to Wrexham obviously as, as, as some other people would I, I would have watched a whole episode on the cop and maybe memories of Jacko and other people that you know famous games and, and I'd have maybe done an interview on there before they demolished it a bit more on the demolishing maybe they got it right it was just enough and maybe to other people that isn't interesting let us know if you 
if you found that part not interesting you found it really interesting obviously for local fans it it's been there it's been part of their experience i know we've had discussions on twitter spaces and stuff previously rich of people who watched their first game there and their dad took them on there or they snuck on there sometimes after school after a night get up for a night game and all that sort of stuff L- lovely little cool stories like that and neil roberts was great because he's been on there he's he, he scored in front of a cop and, and all that sort of stuff um so that phil salmon and the cop and i actually really like the intro song um by a guy called john hume who's i think he's la based but he's i think it might be an australian singer composer um and I, what was I it called the intro don't don't you skip the intro um it's called don't forget and i think it's been specifically written don't it's don't forget brackets welcome to wrexham it's on spotify i mean last i checked on youtube it had like 200 views i'm sure that will rock it in the weeks to come if that's the consistent theme um and in a way the reason i liked it was because some of the lyrics are about basically don't don't forget where you've come from uh don't don't forget where you've been and it wasn't just about the cop it was just generally i felt like as as cool as wrexham is now and and it talks about in the doc about the shirts selling out and all that sort of stuff can't forget where we came from and i tweeted this week which it said what does it mean to be a wrexham fan i said it means going to an away game where the opposition doesn't warm up and still beat you 4-2 which was that famous away day at ebbs fleet a few years ago and i don't know i think you've always got to and that's not a, I'm a bigger fan than you're, than you're a bigger fan. None of that. Just it's important that everybody, first day or 100 days or 1,000 days or 10 million days in, knows where the club's been and where it's come from. Yeah, and you can't forget those roots whatsoever. I also thought, though, on the flip side to that, I did quite like that sort of quick-fire phantom across the world who had been to Wrexham. You had the guys from Malaysia, you had the Portuguese fans, Australians, um, the Americans, of course, lots of North Americans in there, and yeah, it was just really interesting. I, I did like the the chance to relive it as well, and that, that I mean, when as soon as Mark Griffith starts talking, it's that first day of the season hype. You do get excited again, and you, you see last season's kit, which felt new at the time. Elliot Lee being this mysterious man on the bench. Well, that's, why I've, that's why I've worn it. I've worn this one in prep- in, in honor of the last season, um, last season, the shirt from last season. So um, we're going back in time. But yeah, Elliot Lee, carry on. I've interrupted you there. Yeah, I mean, it's just, I, I, did, I did quite like, like like a lot of it. I mean, you know, I'm a Wrexham fan. I'm going to watch all the Wrexham content I can. I'm going to digest it. And there's a lot of room for it to grow. I'd also say that last season, the last season of Welcome to Wrexham, I thought the really amazing episodes were the like final five or six. I think the, the series really grew into it because, of course, you have to establish characters. You've got to get these storylines. And then you have the character development and... You, the story will go on. You'll get more investors as it goes along. So, you know, I'm not being, I'm not trying to be. I did see there was that review this week calling it what sort of basically a. Uh, an ad, got the, I can't, the I'm in, not. The independent yeah. was it like something like um, first basically some kind of propaganda machine, capitalist yeah. propaganda. I, I'm not going down that route. I'm not saying that I'm disappointed with it whatsoever. I've really enjoyed it still for what it was, but I'm confident and I know that as the series goes series goes on, the episodes should get a bit more refined. We'll have greater interest you'll know the characters a bit better the season will get a bit better as well spoiler alert and yeah i'm looking forward to seeing how it, how it develops again and yeah just delighted to have it back on the, on the screen and again i was watching it i was watching that first sort of big scene with rob and ryan where they learn to curtsy and they're having their and not learn to curtsy sorry they're learning their sort of bow yeah the bows and the manners for for the royal visit and i was watching it just thinking like these guys own our football club. How lucky are we that these two guys, these Hollywood guys, these guys we, that we know from different endeavours, own Wrexham Football Club still? I, I had another pinch moment. I was like, how is this real? How the hell is this this uh, real? And Rich, I, I, thought, great. I thought that Rob basically spoke for a lot of the fan base when he sort of dismissed, not dismissed the idea, but he was he was head puzzled by the idea that you yeah. would bow to another person. And... Um, I think that's again just his roots. I don't, I don't think he thinks he's above anyone else or below anyone else or, or whatever, uh, and that's how maybe how it should be. And, and not the thing is Ryan. Ryan also was very quick to point out the King of England, but yeah, I, and not the King I, of uh, yeah. the UK. You know, King of England. Yeah. And um, I yeah, think as well so, you mentioned there though. What I enjoyed about that was when we saw the trailer, I was very very worried this would be 
targeted to a North American audience of here's the British monarchy and we're gonna you know we're gonna <laughs> bow down to them. It's gonna be all you know it's gonna go down all those horrible stereotypes of beef eaters and all that crap. But it wasn't forced down your throat. It was like this is why they're visiting. This is why we're doing it. They're not forcing you and saying you've got to like Re- if you like Rex, you've got to like the royal family. I think you know it wasn't done that way. So. I know there'll be some Wrexham fans who be like, I'll give that one a miss because I don't want to give them the, the time of day. But I thought it was handled quite well and quite delicately. And like you said, probably made sense in a way having it as episode one because that narrative's out of the way now. Yeah, I almost I almost thought they didn't make as much of it as I thought they would have done, which is not a... I don't yeah, think that's no, a, a not good a problem. Up. I don't think that's a good yeah. up, but it's not a problem. I just... I was expecting them to give us maybe previously unseen audio. I was expecting the conversation between maybe as they went down the line. Um, I, I don't know. I thought they really would have amped that up as a big, maybe its own episode. And I think maybe they read the room and just thought, not going to be much appetite. for. I mean, I know it's not solely, this is not a documentary solely for Wrexham fans. I totally get that. But, but I did that, think that, that ties made, into what you said earlier yeah. about even the intro song, not forgetting where you've come from. And whether you like it or not, when the takeover is do- done, when Robin Ryan aren't owning Wrexham anymore, that hardcore demographic are going to be the ones carrying the club forward. And hopefully there's a lot more people to do it, and hopefully we never have the dark days we had in the past. But you've got to still cater to that hardcore audience that have, that have supported the club and that you alluded to with Phil Salmon of AC Engineering with yeah. the, the the cop banners and stuff. So, uh, yeah, I think it was I think it was handled well. And again, I think that one of the positives for me was that it did strike that that balance of there was something in it for the new fans, there was something in it for people who've been there a bit longer. Rich, then I suppose obviously we had the Eastley game, which Elliot Lee comes on, gets the the brace, you know, on his debut. He's going to get more airtime as it goes on. Inevitably, he plays such a key role. He's going to get an interview. You're going to learn a bit more about him, um, and we're going to see more dressing room. We saw. Parky's enthusiasm meter make a return. That's going to be busy, I'm sure, in the weeks to come because we kind of stutter a little bit. They don't film me and James Kelly and all the others that were flamingos in the away end at Yeovil in that second game, which is probably a good thing. We draw 1-1 there. Um, We obviously have that game, Chesterfield. We've said it to death a million times on the podcast. Don't need to get into that. But what I thought was the most interesting part, I thought, of the whole episode was the goalkeeper's in terms of Rob Layton, Mark Howard, and Aidan Davis and the goalkeeping coach. Before I get into my thoughts, what were your thoughts on those those three and their storylines? Again, it made me sort of... I mean, first of all, when they when it went through the these are the new signings sort of montage and it showed Mark Howard goalkeeper, I was like, is that an error? I feel like Mark Howard's been here for years. I can't believe he's only been here a season, weirdly. Rob Layton as well, I was like... God, what a man. I love him so much. I want him to be playing football. I, I'd like him to be playing for Wrexham. And I just just feel so sorry for the guy. And yeah, it was nice to get that little bit of insight again. And again, just to see what a normal, down-to-earth, northern Bolton lad he is. And <laughs> just to see behind, again, the magician's cloth, really. To see that these aren't... I know the club's changing, but these aren't Premier League footballers. These aren't footballers who retire at 35 and that's it. They're made for life. You know, Rob Layton talks about the contract. I'm out of contract at the end of the season. If I get injured, look, I I don't have enough money in the bank to just retire and never work again. Well, that, not if I you know, not if I get injured. If I don't come back from this injury, it was yeah. kind of like if I don't come back, I yeah, whether do. it's Wrexham or not, yeah, I need I need to be playing football because that's what's paying my mortgage. That's what's keeping food on the table for my family. And you might I know you can go down this sort of dangerous sort of avenue where you don't feel sorry for sports people whatsoever because they live a sheltered life and it's all you know they just live in a, in a bubble or whatever but there's, there's a lot the majority of them are you know well well aware of how fortunate they are and well aware how delicate the situation it, it can be as well and Rob Layton's one of them he just so happens that his special talent in life is he's good at keeping the ball out of the net and we got to see that again. We got a reminder that these are, for, although we see them as these, these like totems, and we see them as these, these heroes of ours, and we we put so much pressure on them to give us happiness and bring success into our lives. They're just normal people, and that's Which what I, hammered I home could, for me. I couldn't get over what Ryan Murray, one of the the kind of physio fitness guys, was. Was he like crap? What was he doing to his? It, it was kind of. 
if you've seen it, maybe you can, because I know that we get so many listeners that have all these amazing jobs and get in touch and tell us all these amazing things and put the record straight. Um, maybe Ryan, if he's listening, can get in touch. I don't know what it was, but he looked like he was kind of like grafting away at the wrist. I don't know. Do you, do you see? Do you remember that part? He was kind of like trying. I to saw it. I, on it. I, yeah, I I don't know what the hell was going on. To be honest, um, the worst yeah. part was he looked in real agony, didn't he? They were measuring the the kind of the the degree that he could bend his wrist. I mean, I've fortunately not had any any kind of wrist issue, but I can't, just day to day life. Never mind, being a, never mind. <laughs> never mind being a goalkeeper. I can't imagine just the pay. You know what I mean? Not not only can he not catch the ball, it was he could barely bend his arm without. Yeah, and this is a bloke who I would say is a fairly tough bloke. I mean, we've seen him throw himself into challenges. He's not, you know, he definitely wouldn't be soft in any way. I wouldn't dare call him that. But yet, this must have been. He said, I think he said it's it's pain like he's never felt. Yeah, which yeah, extraordinary. And like I said again, it just hammers home that plays even at this level now are one injury, one freak accident, one. And we saw Paul Mullen with you know his. He thought, you know, his his whole life could have been jeopardy in preseason when he had his injury. That that can just change everything. Your whole life, your whole livelihood, everything where you live, what what you're gonna do in the future. It can change everything in a, in a split second. And yeah, it's it, it was really. I'm really glad we got that insight. And for me as well, like we said as Wrexham fans, what I love the most is getting to see what the players are like away from the pitch, getting to see what Park is like away from the pitch. That is the gold dust for me. And again with Mark Howard, you know, this is a guy who. As we'll probably get onto in the doc, sadly, was scapegoated. There was reasons for it. His performances let him down in some key moments last season. We saw Chesterfield; that was an anomaly. But for I mean, the majority apologized. of last season, he, I mean, he apologised, didn't he? In yeah. front of the it was second half, he apologised to the fans. He knew he'd made an error, but the, the pressure. For the majority of last yeah. season, he was our first choice, and it was a very, very successful season. And for the majority of the games. He was absolutely fine. And again, like you mentioned there, goalkeepers get punished because if they make an error, it results in a goal. But if you sort of made a list of every Wrexham player who's given the ball away in a stupid position or made a key error, Mark Howard would be right at the bottom and there'd be so many other players ahead of him, but they don't get scrutinised as much. So, so Rich, so, so Mark Howard back in contention this season, just to bring it slightly to home. This comment might mean absolutely nothing in the grand scheme of things, but I'm a journalist, so I'm going to read into it. Of course I, can, of course I am. Aidan Davison said he loves or he likes, I don't want to paraphrase here, but he said he likes experienced goalkeepers, which Mark Howard is. Now, Arthur Conquo was on I the I believe bench. the quote was something about, because they bring a calmness and they've that got that it. experience. That was exactly it. So he said they bring the calmness, the experience. Arthur Conquo, the young lad from Arsenal on loan, was on the bench at the weekend. Luke McNicholas played in the reserves. Liam Hall is 18 and, you know, he's not going to be in contention unless there's a spate of injuries and then you probably get an emergency loan. Was that a feather in Mark Howard's cap that maybe he's not just going to be brushed aside here for a, a hot shot that's coming in from Arsenal? I mean, first of all, we don't know when that interview was conducted. They that is have, true. That is true. Could have been patience lost after a uh, maiden head away, shall we say. But I think that certainly you look at the fact we signed Foster as well, you know, they obviously rate having a keeper who's been there and done it before. As much as Parky will be like, will be happy for youngsters to get a chance and for players to, to sort of learn their trades as they go along at Wrexham, the pressure is so high, which again is made clear in episode one of, of season two, that you can't ha- you need to minimise the margin for error everywhere over the pitch, wherever you can. And the fact of the matter is that having a goalkeeper who's been there, done it before, who's made his mistakes, who's learnt from his mistakes is probably a bit more beneficial um, immediately anyway to, to what you're trying to achieve. So I do think that it certainly suggests that Mark Howard will, will still play an integral role for the majority of this season. Again, like I said, though, to bring it current, I think until Mark Howard makes a mistake, I don't see him getting dropped. No. Right, well, we'll end the doc segment on this. We'll end it with a clip in this part for you, so this will be the final part of it. But I'm going to read out some of your thoughts on the doc. I put out a question saying, let us know your thoughts on episode one. And and if you haven't done it here in time for the record, let us know, robryanred at gmail.com. But Rich, we got quite a lot. Um, Jamal, the Rex and Texan, put, I really enjoy it. It seems like this season will feature more on-the-pitch stuff too, which excites me. Um, Dennis has put, I enjoyed Rob's comment that he rejected on behalf of all Americans the idea that um, a longer time to fund and build a new cop stand means higher level of craftsmanship 
another whinge. Um, a Dan, Dan Martin, but highlight of the show is the return of Phil's enthusiasm counter. Lots of housekeeping and setup to get it out of the way and looking forward to the rest of the season. Um, who else have we got here? The Ledge 86, but it was okay. Scene setting for things going forward, such as the goalkeeper situation. Found the money side of things a bit OTT. Uh, talking about, you know, we, we would have been doomed, basically. We're not going to say the, the F word, but we would have been screwed. Uh, we needed promotion, but I'm sure we wouldn't have gone bust. Yeah, that was uh, slightly jarring for me as well. Um, Iron Mike has put um, about Lee being the best. I think he's misread the, misinterpreted the question. Um, Mox has put uh, mostly recap setup and getting Royal Visit out of the way. What really hit was the Lainton stuff. Genuinely knew what was happening there, but actually seeing him was gutting. Want nothing but the best for him. Squire York has put a slow start. It sets the scene for what is to come. For me, the AEC engineering guy, Phil Salmon, and Dixie McNeil cameo were the highlight. I'll read two more. Gareth Collins has put, I enjoyed it, but a bit like last season on the pitch. A bit slow out of the blocks, but then I'm not interested in Big Ears and Noddy. AEC and the Barriers and the history of the cop could have been a bit longer. Nice to see Bojo's empty promise. I'll do what I can, i.e. naff all. And lastly, we'll go with uh, Daniel Denord has put, Very different from season one when I fell in love with the people. This time it was like finding old friends. To my wife, that's Elliot Lee, Jacob Mendy. Oh, that's Mark Howard. They call him Chomp. Voices of podcasts, announcers, Wrexham legends. It was almost like coming back home. That's quite a nice one to end in. Um, there's loads more if you want to see on Twitter. Some people telling us to not spread any spoilers because they haven't watched it yet, so I won't um, give any more. But let us know uh, what you think. Email, comments, uh, YouTube, TikTok, wherever you want to uh, get in touch, uh, Facebook, Twitter, wherever. Um, welcome to Wrexham. Episode 2 is out next week. That is going to be about the quiet zone at the race course. Millie Tipping and Paul Mullin, and he'll be talking about his son Albie and autism. And Episode 3 will be out next week, not yet. The game that Rich was at last season, not County away, um, and how that one unfolded. A bit more dressing room stuff, a bit more on the pitch stuff, and we'll be getting a little bit more momentum now the kind of bureaucracy is out of the way.